Good afternoon, cybersecurity nerds, and welcome back to Las Vegas, Nevada. We are here coming to the close of day two of our coverage at Black Hat. My name is Savannah Peterson. Very excited for this next segment with our new fantastic guest, Adam. Welcome to the show. It's great to be here. It's really exciting to have you. Arctic Wolf having a moment right now. I can imagine it's a busy week. Very busy week, yes. We're talking to a lot of people. What are some of the themes of the conversations you're having this week? The, the cybersecurity conversation couldn't be hotter than it is right now. Front of mind for a lot of people. What have you been talking about? Uh, one of the biggest things we've been, I've been hearing a lot about is the word resilience, right? Yes. Of course, that's, that's top of everyone's mind right now. Uh, of course, in, those of us who've been working in cybersecurity a long time know that resilience has always been a very, very important topic. But of course, due to recent events, a lot of people are talking about it and thinking about it. And so we're here to help everybody start their resilience journey or improve and just be better at making sure that if, when bad things do happen, because they're going to happen, mm -hmm. that you can get back up and running very quickly. Well, I think that matters to every business on the planet right now, so quite a critical surface. Speaking of getting those companies started, you just released a huge free product offering to help companies on their journey. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so it's our Cyber Jumpstart Portal, and it's really a place where uh, companies can come to record, write down, be honest about where they are in their cybersecurity journey and their resilience journey. They have a place to record that, measure that, score it, and uh, they can really start that process, and we are allowing them to do it for free. What made you feel so generous? Well, it's really important that we make sure that people are really looking at what they're doing in cybersecurity and mm -hmm. understanding it to a level that they then know what to do next. So what are the things uh, that they need to improve? Where are areas maybe that they're weak in? How do they find what the priorities are for them to work on? And that really can help them in a lot of areas. And if Arctic Wolf can you know, step in to help them with that journey, we'd really like to. If they you know, need to go to other solutions, that's good too. We are really here just to help people improve their cybersecurity. And I'm the CISO of Arctic Wolf, so I really don't. I'm not on the sales side. That's not really what I do. So this is really exciting for me because I just want to give back to the cybersecurity community and be part of that. And my job is to secure Arctic Wolf, and so this is also something that we can use internally. So it's a win-win for everybody. Plus, I would imagine you learn a lot through seeing people engage with that platform. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it gives us uh, you know, a huge head start when, um, you know, we also have a hotline, so if somebody has something wrong, we, we have an incident response practice. Mm. And if they've already fi you know, filled out anything on uh, the Cyber Jumpstart portal, it gives us you know, a head start in helping them with that really bad day and getting them back up and running as quickly as possible. So yeah. that really helps too. Yeah, I can imagine if for no other reason that would be a reason to engage with you just to have that extra line of defense given the chaos that's going on right now. You've helped over 40,000 organizations with this tool already. It just came out in 2023. Uh, yeah, it's been uh, very popular, so a lot of people want it. I mean, that's adoption and a half. Are there any trends? Are you seeing adoption in, in certain categories faster? Is it ubiquitous across the market? Uh, much like uh, our, our MDR service that we offer to people, we have customers from all stripes, all varieties, all verticals. Uh, we just, we see everything. It, it actually gives us a really good view of what's happening in the threat environment today. Uh, and that's also in our Cyber Jumpstart portal. There's all kinds of customers there. Wow, it's really cool. Yeah. How often do customers graduate from these gateway platforms into much more comprehensive solutions. Not that you have to be in sales, I would just imagine they come to trust you. Uh, yeah, they do. We do have uh, a lot of conversion that comes from that, and it also starts a lot of great conversations, and yeah. we get people who might just get you know, our IR on retainer service as well. And then this can also really help them in their journey toward insurance. That's one of the things that's actually really leveraged against. Everyone you know, is talking about their insurance premiums and how they're going up. Of course, now we might see some, see some softening in that market. But this is a really big help to them seeing what they can do to actually get those premiums lowered. So not just starting, not just starting their journey to you know, actual security and really improving their security stance, but also you know, where can they get insurance and can they get those premiums lowered and where are the best things they could do to, to get those prices down. Yeah, and, and some of the data and research I was doing when I was stalking y'all, only 26% of businesses have a standalone cybersecurity policy? Yes. That's pretty jarring to me. It is, and it's something a lot of companies come to regret when <laughs> you know incidents happen, right? For sure. And, uh, 
Can't as back we that say, one up. yeah, as we say in cybersecurity, you know, it's not if but when, and when and how bad, mm -hmm. right? And you're going to be really, really happy that you got that insurance policy and have those partners helping you. And Cyber Jumpstart is a great place to start if you have no idea what to do. Mm -hmm. You, you know, don't know where to look, or you've been out there, you've talked to brokerages, and those premiums seem too high. We're a great place to start to say, how can I? begin to bring those down and yeah. look more attractive so that more people will want me, you know, to bring those rates down so I can get a good insurance policy. Well, and it makes sense. It's 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 doubly beneficial. You, you know, your system's more secure and you're also not having to pay as much for insurance. It's like Well, and there's a reason they bring the premiums down because if you right. have these things in place, you're much less likely to be breached. So, right. So it's really, you know, a really good thing for you to do. It reinforces the good behavior and keeps the bad guys out. Absolutely. Speaking of bad guys and threats, you have a fascinating background. You come from video games at Disney, all through a almost 12 year stint at the government, senior SWAT team leader, analyzing cybersecurity threats, and now you end up the CISO of Arctic Wolf. What led you to work for them next? You're obviously a curious professional. Yeah, so it's been, it's been a great journey. I've been very blessed to have uh, the privilege and opportunity to, to be able to do all the things that I have. And uh, at each step, I've learned more and I did not start this journey thinking I would love cybersecurity. It was something that, you know, I had the opportunity to work in the FBI, realized I loved it. They were able to give me a lot of training, a lot of experience in that. Mm -hmm. And then when it came time to uh, try it out in the private sector, you know, see if I could, instead of showing up when companies are having bad days and helping them out, which was great, I wanted to see if I could protect a company itself. And when the opportunity to join Arctic Wolf came up, first of all, these are my people, right? I'm a, I'm a security professional, but not only that, I'm a security operator. I yeah. come from that operations and incident response background. That's what we do. It's our bread and butter. So I get to work with my people. And then also, it's a great opportunity to be a CISO of a security company. That's really fun. And one of the, one of the great parts about it is I get to have a role in the product. I've worked at other companies yeah. where, you know, the, the product is not my specialty. It's not my area. So when you get to work at a security company, they... You know, you also get to have a hand in the product and how it comes out. They're going to ask you questions like, you know, what do you think next? What, what would be good? And it's really fun to be involved in the product in a way that maybe most CISOs don't get a chance to be. That is fun. I can see the excitement on your face when you say that. So I know, it's, I know that it's genuine. I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting. Was, was, do, you, uh, do you still get to interface with the government? in your role with Arctic Wolf? It seems like there's a lot of cross industry collaboration going on in cybersecurity. Yeah, so uh, we do have a lot of opportunities, whether it's sharing, you know, indicators of compromise, IOCs back and forth, you know, with mm -hmm. various government agencies, or um, I also still have friends there, so we get to talk and have, you know, the kind of conversations over choice beverages about what's going on. And of course, if we ever see anything um, that requires us to report to the to law enforcement, we do that as well. So I get a number of different yeah, ways kind of to, uh, to talk and, and interact with law enforcement, in addition to being parts of programs like InfraGuard and things like that, where you get to interact with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies. So lots of opportunities. I actually encourage everyone, every security professional is part of an organization. If you haven't made contact with the FBI, if you're in the US and you haven't made contact with the FBI in your area, a lot of people don't know, you can just call them up. You can call up the cyber squad and say, hey, we want to know you, we want to get to know you, and they yeah. would be overjoyed to come out, talk with you. They could even give presentations to your company. They can do that. And it's just a great chance to get to know them. And the reason they want you to do this is so that, one, you'll be more likely to report to them if you do have a breach, and when bad things happen, you're not scrambling to figure out who do we call. Right. You already know you got no the card. Yeah. You know, I used to do this as an FBI agent, a lot of outreach with companies, and because you know they're not that likely to call the FBI, but they're likely to call Adam. And so I right. did that a lot, and uh, I encourage people to go out and do that with the FBI, which is what I do as well. I mean, I was just going to say, I think you're the first person to tell me to call the FBI proactively in a yeah. positive fashion versus yeah. something else. But I think that's great for people to hear. I don't, I, I've been really impressed this week in particular just about the amount of collaboration and the people sharing tips and tricks or free tools or things that are going on, whether, whether it be the FBI or, or a, a small startup. Everyone's in this together to make it better. It's clear education and partnership is really high on your list. I love this also when I was doing my research. Y'all are doing a 
presentation in Edinburgh on how to build cyber resilient schools. So I want to ask you in a couple sound bites, how do you build a cyber resilient school? It's, it's obviously got to be a big issue for parents and people around the world. Yeah, we actually have a lot of state and local governments and that include school districts as our customers. And they really need to start thinking about how to build those, uh, those schools as resilient. They need to look at their systems, partner with organizations like Arctic Wolf and others to make sure that they're resilient. But then also we want to make sure that the individuals in those schools, kids, That's what I'm thinking. are resilient, yeah. that they understand cybersecurity, they understand the fundamentals. You know what's amazing is the fundamentals of cybersecurity actually don't change for an individual or an organization. They're the same basic things. You gotta protect your identity. Mm -hmm. So usernames and passwords, use a password manager. It's a little more complicated in an organization, but it's the same principle. Mm -hmm. Keep your stuff up to date. Make sure that everything is patched. Keep your phone up to date. You know, if you're a kid or you have a phone, make sure that it's on the latest version. And then being aware of social engineering, be that phishing or any other types of scams. You just need to be aware of these things and have ways that you protect yourself. And so we, we go into um, organizations like schools to educate people, and it's, it's really the same principles. And it's fun to be able to share that with them and share that with others. We actually have a program. So the office I'm in is based uh, out of Utah. So I'm in, uh, we're in Pleasant Grove, Utah. That's where it's one of our security operations center, centers are. And we have over 150 operators in that office, and that's where I work out of. And we actually started a program there where we educate actually seniors in the same way, teaching cool. seniors to be so cyber important. Resilient. So many of them, unfortunately, fall prey to a, you know scams and things oh, like yeah. this. So it's it's a way that we give back to uh, to those folks as well. So we want to spread the cybersecurity knowledge, the cybersecurity love, in as many places as we can. I bet that's really heartwarming work. Well, it's one of the reasons I was in the FBI, and it was one of the most uh, rewarding things is to help people become more secure. Yeah. You hope you don't have to do it after they have a breach or after they get right. hacked, but you don't want to let that opportunity go to waste either. Yeah, you want to give them that confidence and that trust. And I've done some work with AARP, and the, the senior community really hits a chord with me because they're so vulnerable and significantly more vulnerable than, than most other populations because of that and yeah. often ignored when it comes to tech education unless you're a very large government body. So I think that's really lovely. Thanks yeah. for doing that. Yeah. Is there anything that scares you in particular about our threat landscape right now? So, I mean, one of the things that I think is of biggest concern is uh, really, I, I said it earlier, is our resilience. Mm -hmm. um, but if I was gonna pick something right now, I would talk about uh, these AI tools that are out there. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I bring those up is because they were unleashed on the world, ubiquitous to everyone who has an internet connection basically for a very small fee. You can have extremely powerful tools at your fingertips. And right now it's accelerating lots of different types of attacks like social engineering right. and things like that. And I think we might be a little bit overconfident in our ability to detect these. Mm -hmm. And it's having all kinds of effects, whether it be direct, you know, assistance to to hacking and finding vulnerabilities, if it's things like uh, helping people do social engineering, now there's not bad grammar and phishing emails, things like right. that, but all the way up to mis- and disinformation like deep fakes. I don't think we have the cultural machinery, the cultural tools to deal with this yet. We're going to build them, and we'll build them over time, but right now that's one thing that, that concerns me, and I don't know if we're necessarily taking this serious enough. Obviously in the security community, we're talking all about it yeah. here at Black Hat, but in general I have found either uh, maybe maybe a little bit of nonchalance or mm -hmm. a little overconfidence in our ability. Oh, I can see those. Well, we got to remember that these tools are as bad as they're going to be right now. Right. They're only going to get better and they're going to get more involved. And yes, as we mature, we're going to use these for good too. And there's, there's uh, you of know course. talks here at the conference <clears throat> about that, but it's one of the things that concerns me, especially this year, as we have elections all over the world happening, this is just a test bed for these adversaries who want to just, you know, throw wrench, wrenches into the works and try to see what they can do, preparing for the future and being able to use this. So that's one thing I see in the threat landscape that's of concern to me. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we have a tendency to overinflate our human potential a lot when it comes to even eyewitness accounts in a courtroom or being able to tell. We had Nicole from Dark Trace on earlier today, and she was saying they've done tests with folks with... AI generated content versus not, we can only tell 50% of the time. Yeah. And that's at its worst, to your very yes. point. Just imagine where we're gonna be in six months. I mean, even just the way they're using Kamala Harris's voice in deep fake ads already, it's haunting to a degree. Yeah. 
And I think that there are some very clever and creative, nefarious folks who have seen how fragile, particularly US elections are in the past. And, and I think it's a huge vulnerability. I think, I think the next 95 days are gonna be kind of wild. They are, they are going to be wild, particularly in this country. But we have to remember, also, these elections are happening all Everywhere. Exactly. over the world. And the thing is, we're putting this tool, like, it's not just nation states now that can use this. Like, right. individuals. Right, and, right, uh, right, right. It's people creating memes, basically. Are, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and a huge percentage of people get all of their news, or the majority of their news, from social media, mm -hmm. which is a place where these memes can just get catch fire. promoted and catch yeah. fire. Yeah. And a lot of people maybe aren't bringing their most... Oh, uh, their, their most awareness to their, their doom the scrolling. Critical thinking isn't their always in the late night and, and really, headline really sort grab. of understanding. And maybe it just hits the back of their mind, but that can really move people's opinions, especially those that maybe aren't as tuned in, like the news junkies. Mm -hmm. the, the people who are not like that are gonna, be, are gonna be swayed. And that's another thing we like to do as humans. We like to think, I'm not able to be manipulated. Oh, like, right. I'm smart, I know better. Oh, yeah. And we have to understand, all of us have to approach all of cybersecurity with humility. Like any of us can be tricked at any time, even you know, me who's been right. doing this for years and years. But all of us also could be manipulated. And that's really important for us to understand with these mis and disinformation tools. So it's not just the security aspect, but the infor like true information security. Like, is this information true? And these AI tools are really adding an, an addition, additional, as you said, exciting element to uh, what we're dealing with in the next few days, yeah, or yeah. the next a few months. Yeah, yeah, and it's only, I mean, whatever happens here and elsewhere will set the precedent for, like you said, elections everywhere else. What's your advice to folks, you know, even just the average voter during these election cycles, wherever they might be in the world, how can they be most savvy to the, to the potential lies they're being sold? Yeah, I think there's a number of things that are, are really concerning to me. And one is uh, going to be talking about, you know, voter turnout and, you know, imagine somebody is able to post something 24 hours before an election that's a false story about what's happening at a voting place. You know, was there a shooting right, right, there, right. some sort of violence, or it got moved, or the hours are changed. I think people really need to take time to understand where, where can I get really good, reliable information mm -hmm. and make sure they're going to those sources for the information about the candidates and what they say, for sure, but also about you know how to vote and things like that. And make sure they're taking the time and not getting their information from social media sites and places like this. And I think we need to start a real good conversation about this nationally, about mm -hmm. do we want our news to come from these places? Do we want, I mean, these social media companies have a huge role to play in this, and largely we've left them unregulated. I mean, they are a huge business per market cap, and Almost we don't an we don't have an FAA, yeah. we don't have an FCC, we no, don't have no, no. any of those regulatory bodies over them, and it's almost almost like something we hold, uh, you know, sacrosanct about the internet that we're not going to do that. And I think we really need to take a look at that as a community and decide: is this the way we want to have those those regulated? So that's that's one thing, but also just the aspect of like the way uh, these election workers, I mean, a lot of them are just kind of normal people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are getting, you know, death threats and other things. Uh, oh, it's wild. I, I worked at polls in California. Concern. And even being in California, my, my county is a little split. Or my, my town, actually, not so much San Mateo County, but Pacifica. And uh, I have been spit at. I've had things thrown at me. And that's just in nonpartisan apparel, standing there to collect your ballot. And that's before this era of AI. So I, um, I actually have a neighbor who puts fake news in my yard as a result of my yard signs. So it really it affects us on an individual level, and I think it stirs this cauldron of animosity and spite that really shouldn't exist against our fellow humans because of the fallacies that are spread. So I'm glad we got to talk about it. Yeah. So I, I just really think we need to get a place, need to get to a place where. Uh, we're back talking about substantive issues. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I want people to be passionate about their side and talk about it, but it's this this fake information and interference from yeah. parties that don't have, like, a true interest in the free and fair election. They just right. want to sow craziness chaos. or chaos or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah, that's that's what, something we need to be concerned about. And it also has a direct effect on cybersecurity as well because all of those things can be leveraged to breach an organization. Exactly. Like that. Yeah. yeah, in the same way. Gosh, it's like the fake emails to go buy iPhone gift cards and all that stuff. It's just mag magnified. Kind of haunting to think about. Uh, on a more positive <laughs> note, Adam, <clears throat> since you're a fantastic guest and I suspect we'll have you on many times again, what do you hope to be able to say, let's call it at Black Hat next year, that you can't yet say today? Uh, let's see. I would like to say 
that we had a, a uh, free and fair election, unbesmirched by uh, attacks, be they direct cybersecurity attacks or others, and that we've had a peaceful transition into uh, a new government. We're doing well there. And I would also like to say that we have gone a full 12 months without a major cybersecurity incident outage in the country and that people's uh, organization's resilience is much stronger than it is today. And we learned a lesson from uh, any of these events that have happened recently. Beautifully stated. What a sound bite. Thank you so much, Adam. Really appreciate you taking the time today. And thank all of you for tuning in to our two days of fabulous coverage here at Black Hat. We're in Las Vegas, Nevada. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for cybersecurity coverage.